Every building faces the same basic realities. Gravity, air pressure, temperature, and moisture. And across North America, widespread building failures have shown that most modern homes don't fail because they fall down. They fail because they get wet and can't dry in time. The result is often microbial growth inside of wall assemblies, hidden colonies of mold and bacteria that degrade indoor air quality and compromise occupant health. Over time, that same trapped moisture can also weaken the structure itself, causing wood and composite materials to rot from the inside out. And it's not rare. About 85% of buildings suffer water damage at some point in their life. And when that moisture gets trapped, it's not just a durability issue, it affects the air we breathe. With the advent of modern materials like plastic, concrete, and synthetic finishes, water damage and indoor mold have become almost ubiquitous in our built environment. The field of moisture management in building science emerged largely in response, a discipline dedicated to understanding how moisture actually moves through buildings and how to design systems that can manage it. Today, that understanding is organized around four key control layers, water, air, vapor, and thermal. Each one plays a role in managing moisture, and together they define how we build for better and for worse. In this series, we'll look at each layer in turn, how modern construction tries to manage moisture, where it often fails, and how rammed earth building addresses the same challenges in a simpler, more unified way. In this episode, we'll start with the first and most visible layer, the water control layer. Before we dive into walls, it's worth mentioning the obvious. The best defense against water starts at the top. A well-designed roof does more to pre protect a building than any membrane or flashing ever could. Steeper slopes, generous overhangs, and properly detailed eaves keep most rain away from the walls in the first place. Roofs deserve their own discussion, and we'll cover that in a separate video. But for now, let's look at how we manage the water that does reach the walls. The water control layer is everything that sheds, drains, or redirects liquid water before it can reach materials that aren't meant to get wet. In theory, it's simple. In practice, it's one of the most common points of failure in modern construction. Most exterior claddings, siding, stucco, or brick veneer act as drainage screens, not true barriers. They shed most of the rain, but not all of it. Wind-driven rain, surface tension, and capillary action always find their way through the tiny openings, cracks, and nail holes. That's why behind nearly every modern cladding, you'll find a weather-resistive barrier, a membrane, house wrap, or taped sheathing layer designed to block and redirect water that gets through. But when that weather-resistive barrier is torn, reverse lapped, or poorly sealed, water can slip behind it and become trapped against the sheathing. Modern walls depend on perfect sequencing. Every overlap, joint, and flashing has to be right. One backward detail, one missed seal, and water can find its way in. When it does, failures can be obvious or hidden. Sometimes it's clear. Peeling paint, cracked stucco, efflorescence, or swelling trim that tells you something's wrong. Other times, the damage stays invisible for years. Moisture trapped behind cladding, slowly rotting sheathing, and feeding mold colonies you never see until it's too late. Modern materials often don't forgive small mistakes. For example, OSB swells and delaminates when wet, and paper-faced drywall and cell cellulose insulation will feed mold. Even fiberglass bat insulation could hold pockets of moisture long after a leak has stopped. The leaky condo crisis in the Pacific Northwest and Canada's coastal provinces was just one large-scale example. Thousands of buildings built a code yet unable to drive. To understand why these failures happen so often, we need to understand all the ways that water can move. Water doesn't just flow downward, it can also climb upward or sideways through something called capillary action. The same way that a sponge wicks moisture. 
When water encounters tiny pores or cracks, surface tension pulls it along those pathways, and some materials are especially good at this. Both rammed earth and concrete are capillary active because of their fine pore structure, and that's why they can wick moisture from the ground or sideways through a footing or a foundation. We try to stop that by using a capillary break, gaps or hydrophobic layers that interrupt the pathway and let gravity take over again. Examples of capillary breaks include things like washed gravel under a concrete slab, a, a sill gaskets or membranes under bottom plates, drainage mats or granular layers behind foundation walls. Every building must deal with water, but rammed earth does it with quiet confidence. Its dense mineral structure helps to shed rain, buffers humidity, and reveals wetting before it becomes damage. In North America, where freeze-thaw cycles can be severe and rainfall heavy, builder and designer Mara Krayanov helped pioneer the use of stabilized rammed earth. By adding a small amount of cement or lime, the microscopic pores within the earth mix become partially coated and filled. This does two important things. The first is it reduces the continuous capillary pathways that would otherwise draw water inward or upward. And it also improves freeze-thaw resistance because if water can't wick deeply, it can't freeze and expand inside the wall. In many stabilized mixes, silane and siloxane-based additives, products like Plastic Cure, are also blended directly into the mix. These compounds line the microscopic pores and make their inner surfaces hydrophobic, helping the wall shed liquid water while still allowing vapor to move through. In Europe, builders like Martin Rauch the Austrian architect and craftsman leading the revival of raw rammed earth, take another approach. Instead of densifying the surface with cement and hydrophobic additives, he leaves the outer layer as a sacrificial skin that takes weathering, so the structural mass behind it stays intact. That layer is only a few millimeters deep, designed to erode gradually and be renewed as needed. He also textures the surface so rain can't form continuous sheets. It breaks into droplets and drains away. The texture itself becomes part of the wall's moisture management system, keeping it fully vapor open and true to the material's natural behavior. Both approaches still need good detailing, sills, overhangs, and drainage, but their resilience comes from the material itself not from layers of plastic trying to keep nature out. No matter what we build with, the physics stay the same. Good geometry and careful detailing are universal moisture defenses. For example, the ground should slope away from the foundation. Window sills and head flashings should angle downward and outward. Drip edges and kerfs stop water from wrapping around ledges. Overhangs and well-placed flashings keep most rain off the wall to begin with. Caulking and sealants can help where needed at joints, penetrations, and transitions. All of this, slopes, flashing, careful layering, and capillary breaks, relies on craftsmanship. Both light frame and rammed earth buildings need it. The difference is that rammed earth is inherently more forgiving. It's a solid, continuous wall. No hidden cavities for water to sneak into and get trapped. If moisture does enter, it's visible, local, and can dry naturally. In layered modern walls, one missed detail can let water slip behind cladding, where it can stay hidden for months, creating moisture and microbial growth problems. Managing liquid water is about giving it a clear path shedding, draining, and drying in ways that work with gravity and the nature of the materials. Rammed earth handles this with quiet logic. Its dense mineral body doesn't rely on membranes or coatings to stay dry. It manages moisture through its own mass and texture. In wet or cold climates, it still needs good detailing, solid foundation, well-designed sills, and protective overhangs. 
but when these are in place, the material itself does most of the work. But liquid water is only part of the story. Air is an even greater carrier of moisture, invisible but powerful, moving through the joints and layers of modern walls. In the next episode, we'll explore the air control layer, how pressure differences drive airflow, why most airtight buildings aren't as tight as we think, and how rammed earth, by its very nature, remains dense and continuous enough to handle air with elegant simplicity.